Welcome to another segment of the BYU Management Society's Learn from Professionals initiative. Our goal is to provide guidance to young adults that are either exploring various careers or are ready to jump their career. So today we have an opportunity to, to learn from a seasoned entrepreneur and business owner. Mr. Mark Leck is a business and technology leader and entrepreneur with deep experience creating and building successful organizations and products. He is, a self, he is self described as a product CEO and has founded or co founded half a dozen currently operating companies that have individual leadership and management teams. Mark attended BYU as an electrical engineering major. The first company he co founded after returning from serving a mission in Melbourne, Australia, was Red X. As uh, Red X is a real estate SaaS technology company that helps residential real estate generate increased sales. So as the prospects for Red X continued to increase, the number of credits that Mark took at BYU continued to decrease. Another of his companies, Green Seed Technologies, is his primary umbrella corporation or conglomerate. It owns Red X, Wave, his communications company, Story, their social media content logic company, and several other businesses. These businesses help to support the United Angels Foundation, a nonprofit he started when his daughter was born with Down syndrome. These companies continue to support the parents and, and families of individuals with special needs. So Mr. Leck was uh, born in Canada. He grew up in Northern California. He lived in Australia for five years. Outside of his work, uh, Mark is an avid pilot. He loves skiing, amateur radio, uh, dirt biking, scuba diving, skeet and trap shooting, ice hockey. Uh, he's he's very busy guy. He lives in Springville, Utah with his wife, Amber, and their five children. So welcome. Welcome, Mark. Hey, thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Mark, could you... Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your journey that you've taken to becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think, um, look, ever since I was a young kid, and I, I think this is pretty common with a lot of entrepreneurs, I had a, an interest in business. Um, I actually um, got into business because of my interest in computers, and I got into computers because of my interest in flying. When I was a 10-year-old kid, my dad bought us a computer with a flight simulator, and I um, wanted to always be a pilot. And when it came down to deciding which university I wanted to go to, I was living in Australia at the time, and, and um, I prayed and asked Heavenly Father what I needed to do and if I should go to the Air Force Academy or to BYU and to study computers. And the answer I got was go to BYU, study computers, and you can fly later. And in my mind, uh, BYU and computers was BYU computers and business, and I would fly later. Um, I knew that that was sort of the entrepreneurial route, or I was going to go to the military. And um, my wife, Amber, and I joked that we were destined to meet no matter what, because either of those choices would have led us to meet one another. And so... Um, Anyways, but yeah, that me getting into computers created the opportunities for entrepreneurship. Um, even though, you know, I had little businesses and ventures maybe that didn't necessarily revolve around that when I was a kid, but everything as I started as a young adult was software, computer related, technology related. And um, I had the opportunity right before my mission to go work for Omniture, which was bought out by Adobe and, and why Adobe's in Utah Valley now. Um, that was an incredible experience. I learned a ton being in sort of Omniture's early phases of a startup company there. And then that led me to some other opportunities that after my mission led to us starting the Red X for the first time. And so, um, I think like most entrepreneurs, I had those sort of ambitions as a kid. And then 
um, actually my interest in software created the opportunity for me to get into it. So Mark, what, is it, what does it mean to be a serial entrepreneur? <laughs> so, I mean, what the, the, I actually hate the term serial entrepreneur, which is funny um, because I think of a serial killer and I, there's a lot of entrepreneurs I've met who they, they, they move from one venture to the next and nothing works. They, they, they kind of kill a bunch, but I think in the best sense, it's like, you like to keep creating and building more and, and um yeah, I think I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, I, I like to build stuff. That's my primary interest. Um, I'm not a sales CEO. I'm I'm not a finance CEO. I'm a I'm a product CEO. So I like knowing what the problem or the pain point is and then trying to find a way to solve that. And in my mind, if you can build a if you can identify a problem in the market and build a decent solution, people should want to pay you money for that. And uh, so money becomes a measure of success rather than, uh, or a measure of the quality of your solution rather than maybe a, a, the end objective, right? Okay. So Mark, uh, tell me there's, there's entrepreneurs that are really great at startups, but they're horrible at running a company. And then there's, there's entrepreneurs that can both start companies and run companies. Where are you? Uh, uh, I probably depends who's judging me. Um, I think, you know, I think all of us have weaknesses, right? I mean, I like to start companies. Um, I think some might view me as, as sort of stronger in that area. I think, um, I also really enjoy running them. I mean, my, my background in software engineering, you kind of tend to be a process driven person. And um, I like problem solving. So uh, software engineering used to give me an opportunity to problem solve a lot. And then as I brought that into an entrepreneurial environment, like with Red X, my first role, I was a co-founder and CTO of the company, right? And so I was building the technology for the company. And that was one of the primary interests that I had was, was I capable of building a product that would sort of meet this startup demand? But as the as the startup kept going, all the other problems with business started getting created. Boy, we need to drive more sales. We need to create new partnerships. We need to find distribution. So I got um, just as satisfied trying to solve those problems as I did software engineering problems. And then as we grew, it was like, um, I remember we hired a uh, more sophisticated CFO at one point. And early on, again, this was to put it in context, I was maybe 25 years old at the time and, and stuff like, you know, still a very young entrepreneur. And he looked at the business and he said, hey, you want to run this like a lemonade stand or you want to run it like a business? And it's like, oh, I want to run it like a business. So I had to learn and grow and develop my knowledge on that side. But I enjoyed learning and growing through the process. And I, I've always enjoyed tackling problems that stop the business that, that whether it's a marketing problem, a sales problem, a, a, a product problem or a operations problem. So um, I think I've enjoyed running businesses as well, just because you learn more and it, it stretches you as a person. So Mark, one of the one of the common traits of a successful entrepreneur business owner is that you surround yourself with a successful uh, leadership team. So what are some of the traits that you're looking for when you're, when you're hiring someone to be part of your, your executive team? What are you looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if I'm looking for someone as part of our executive team, um, Look, obviously, I'm looking for depth of skill and knowledge in, in a certain area of expertise. Um, no matter who we hire in our companies, we look for a fit against our core values. And um, I'm a huge believer that 100% of company culture comes through um, your HR processes. Your, your company culture is determined by who you hire, who you fire, and who you promote. And so, um, you know, as part of that, I think I, I look for leaders who fit with our company's core values. Um, and I look for, um, I look for leaders that, that, um, 
can create a vision for their individual organization and can um, be clear headed and focused on what their objective needs to be and can get after it independently. I think, you know, my expectation is that executives should be able to run their division of the business as an independent division and collaborate appropriately with the other teams. Okay. Uh, so you have various companies, you have an umbrella company called Green Seed Technologies. Can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the role of Green Seed and, and the companies are, that are uh, within it? Yeah, so, so Green Seed Technologies, at a high level, you can think of it as an incubation company. Um, its entire purpose is to develop and launch profitable businesses that have amazing cultures and can create meaningful employment for people within our community. And, you know, one of our specific focuses is to do that through what we consider sound business principles. Um, there's a lot of tech companies in Silicon Valley and Silicon Slopes that um, their focus is not on what I would consider traditional sound business principles, like we should run the business with a profitable business plan from day one, right? A lot of, a lot of um, like software VC backed companies operate at a negative burn rate. They, um, they just do things that to me are like opposed to business 101 type principles. And so, um, you know, we, we tend to be focused on building companies by uh, bootstrapping them, self-funding and um, stuff like that. So that's Green Seed's main purpose. Um, it wasn't the first company I started. In fact, uh, you know, as you read my bio, the first company I helped co-found was Red X. And then that created an opportunity over time for me to go um, explore my entrepreneurial interests in other areas. And so as I had other business ideas that went beyond the boundaries of sort of Red X as a company, um, I wanted a place for those new ideas, those green seeds to go um, be and uh, to have a place to develop and nurture and cultivate those. And so green seeds started as just this little like, Hey, here's a place I can go explore some new ideas. And over time it's grown. Um, we've, We've bought multiple companies. We've um, started other companies. We've got an R&D shop that works within Green Seed. And, and that's fun because, you know, it really allows me to sort of scratch my, my creative itch a little bit there. Okay. Mark, could you, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your education path and also what advice would you give for other individuals that are as far as education that are considering becoming a business owner or an entrepreneur? Yeah, so, um, okay, so, so the path I took, I guess I would characterize as maybe a less common path. Um, I, you know, went through my normal high school education. My family moved a lot. I, I finished high school in um, Australia, uh, ended up going to BYU, which was exciting. Um, began studying uh, with the idea that I was going to do electrical engineering, even though more of my background was in software development. One of my beliefs is that entrepreneurs should study in their undergrad uh, a subject that gives them a skill set that is valuable in a startup environment. So whether that's uh, some type of engineering or product, um, something like marketing or sales or finance, you know, if you can do your undergrad and have a tangible skill that someone starting a business would want in that company in a startup phase, I think that's really helpful. And then I think on top of that, you can layer like an MBA or something, get more business uh, experience onto that. But so I was studying electrical engineering, um, doing all my, my prereqs, and I had come home from my mission from Australia again, and have been contacted by one of my future co-founders um, to see if I wanted to go start a business. He and I had worked on a company before my mission um, that uh, didn't continue when I left, and um, but he wanted me to get involved. Uh, he needed a software engineer, so I fit the bill. Even though I'd been out on my mission for two years and I said I, I was really rusty at coding, he's like, oh, you'll figure it out. And um, so that got me involved in this new startup. And as the startup started to progress, uh, you know, one of the main things 
you have to do in a startup is try to reduce the risk profile as soon as possible. You know, 85, 90% of startups fail. So how do you reduce that risk profile? So we were focused on that. And as the, the risk of that startup began to drop, I started to drop some of my classes at BYU. And I also started to take other classes. Um, one time my mom called me and was like, you're, why are you taking an accounting 200 class? You're, you're studying electrical engineering. And I said, well, yeah, but I'm, you know, you know, I'm working on this startup on the side and two of my partners, they got MBAs and they're talking about stuff with P&Ls and balance sheets. And, and I don't know as much about that. I need to fill the gaps on my knowledge. So I signed up for an accounting 200 class. And for her, that looked like a, a bit of a distraction. Um, but for me, I was trying to get a hold of the knowledge the best way I could to fill in the gaps that I had. Yeah. And so anyway, so um, that kept happening. And then eventually there reached this point where the risk was low enough and the opportunity looked high enough that I had a decision to make about how, how full on I wanted to go. And I called my parents and told them I, I thought I wanted to drop out of BYU and that made my mom very nervous. She was really uncomfortable. She reminded me that the prophet had said that we need to get a good education. And um, I think I might've quoted her uh, something that my business partners were telling me, which was don't let school stand in the way of a good education. <laughs> and, uh, and anyways, my dad was listening to all of this. And at the end of it, he wisely counseled me and said, look, Mark, I don't think I'd tell this to everybody. But my advice for you is that opportunities will come and go, but school will always be there. And that was kind of a turning point. And I just said, thanks. Thanks, mom and dad. I love you guys. And I kind of started thinking, hey, you know, maybe this will go for 12 months or 18 months and mm -hmm. I'll learn a lot from it was kind of my mindset. And uh, 18 years later, we're kind of still there. So and is that like, about the time that you, uh, you got married? Yeah, in fact, I, I got married and I was a double E major. And then shortly after uh, I was married to my wife, I dropped out. And I'm sure my father-in-law, that, that might have made him a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but it, it ended up working out, which was good. All right. So, Mark, uh, there's formal education and there's informal education. It sounds like your informal education has been uh, really important to you. Uh, so what advice would you give to individuals? Uh, I know you personally, you, you're involved in a life, lifelong pursuit of education. How do you do that? Yeah, well, one of the things that I love about BYU, and I, I'm going to hash it, but one of their, I think their main things is, is um, kind of being a perennial learner, like always learning, always growing, always and, and I think that that's obviously very strong within our church culture. We're trying to always be progressing. And, you know, even, even different from when I started Red X in 03, there was no iPhones, there was no Gmail, there was no, um, you know, a lot of the tools that we have today to get started. And so, uh, you know, we, we know that we live in a time where there is more information and resources available to someone who wants to uh, aggressively learn on their own than there ever has been. So my advice is you got to learn as much as you can, get as much education as you can. The fact that my path in life ended up taking me out of BYU a little bit premature, I, I think I view as kind of unique to the path that God put me on. But um, when in doubt, I kind of go back to exactly what the prophet has said, which is everybody should go get a good education. And I want my children to go to college and get a degree, but I also want them to know how to take advantage of the incredible tools we have. Uh, even in our own business, we joke that, you know, some people struggle to use Google effectively. They come in, they've got a problem. And, you know, uh, contrary to popular opinion or perception, not all executives have every answer either. Right. And so sometimes we might be facing a problem and uh, we joke that our ability to Google might just be better than your ability to Google um, and, and figure stuff out. And now I watch my own son who's 13 and he is learning at a rate that 
is is striking to me how fast he's figuring stuff out and how deep he can go into certain subjects and he doesn't go after google right away he goes after youtube first oh and nice. he's he's listening from influencers and knowledge and they're they're presenting and you know i was talking to my wife about it but i'm like wow you you think of um youtube and how a person would learn and they can learn by listening with subtitles they can learn by reading and they can learn visually on YouTube, where if I Google it, I'm reading articles and I'm, I'm more of a one-dimensional learner. So get all the formal education you can, get all the uh, informal education you can, and leverage the amazing technology tools that are out there like Google and YouTube and social media to get as much information as you can. You can literally, if you're motivated, learn anything you want right now. So Mark, it sounds like you're very successful in your business. You have multiple businesses, but has it has your career always been an, an upward path, or are those are there obstacles that you've had to overcome? Oh yeah, yeah. I love. There's some meme online you guys can look up, but they it's like a meme about success, and it says what success looks like to most people from the outside, and they draw like a line up and to the right, like success just looks like this straight line. And then they said what it actually looks like. And it's got a line, tons of squiggles and ups and downs and everything. And then, and then it ends up at success. I mean, I've never met anybody generally speaking where success was just, just a rocket ship. And there's certainly those stories we read about them definitely in publications like Inc magazine and stuff like that. They almost portray it as, as this, meteoric rise to success. And certainly some people that might happen, but that's, those are outliers, right? If you're looking on right. a bell curve, those are people over there. And I think the, the, the typical path most people are on is, is just, it's not a straight line. So yeah, there's been ups and downs. I started with two partners, um, ended up buying both of them out. Um, so there was lots of struggle and, and trial through that process. Um, I talked the other day with, um, uh, BYU's entrepreneurship lecture series at the Marriott School of Business. And I said, finding a good business partner should, should be uh, at least as hard as finding a wife or, or a good wife or at, at least somewhere close to that, you know? Um, so I've had struggles with partners. I've dealt with um, changing economic environments. Red X, uh, as you mentioned, operates in the real estate space. We went through the Great Recession in 07, 08. The housing industry played a huge role in that recession. So, I mean, we have to learn how to weather that storm. And, you know, uh, yeah, we've had projects that have failed and, and not been successful. And we've had sounds, others that have worked out. So, sounds like part of the game. Sounds like you've, um, it's it, that line that you were talking about, there's, there's been some deviation to that periodically. But so tell us, tell us about, um, what advice would you give to, let's say, a, a person that wants to become a business owner, an entrepreneur, and, and, they, and, and they're bogged down with struggles? What advice would you give to them? Um, yeah, I think it would depend probably specifically on what the struggles are, but um, I'll talk at a high level of, of a few of them. One of them is, uh, look, if you're looking to start a business, um, I think the best time you can start a business is when you've already got a job, right? There's, there's some people that I think have this idea of like, I got to quit, burn the ships, kind of Cortez style and go all in. And um, a lot of the perceptions about entrepreneurs, I, I dislike, you know, there's this perception that you're a high risk taker and I don't view myself as a high risk taker. I view myself as a low calculated risk taker. Um, and so, you know, as you think about a startup, I would start with this idea, which is according to historic statistics, um, 85, 90% of new businesses are going to fail. And so I think that somebody who's looking to start with that should start with that idea. I think I've got a good idea. I'm excited about it. I'm passionate about it. That's one of the challenges about looking at it critically, by the way. Um, but if I look, you know, at these statistics, there's an 85% chance what I'm going to try to start is not going to succeed. And I want to find out why. 
And it doesn't mean that that startup can't succeed, but it might mean in its current form or iteration, it might not. The other thing that I think causes a lot of people to fail is an unrealistic set of expectations around how hard it might be. So like I mentioned in the beginning, I, I'm a huge fan of bootstrapping companies. And that's because if you ask an entrepreneur why they want to be an entrepreneur, typically the type of answers you're going to hear is, I want to be my own boss. I want to control my destiny. I want to fulfill my own vision. I want to control my time. I want to do all this stuff. And generally, those ideals are not compatible with raising money through venture capitalists, right? As soon as you bring on a VC, you've um, brought on a new boss that might be one of the hardest bosses you've ever worked for, right? You've lost control of your destiny. You're not necessarily fulfilling your vision. Um, that can change. So, you know, but, but what they're bringing is money, right? Um, if you think about what a VC is going to do, a venture capitalist are making you sprint as fast as you can in some ways with the gun to your head. And the question is, can you run fast enough? But in a bootstrapped environment, it's kind of about endurance. The question is, can you run long enough? So one of my, my sayings in entrepreneurship for bootstrap companies is nothing good happens in less than five years. And I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, I'm going to go build this. I'm going to go launch it. And in one year, I'm going to be wealthy. And, and so when you're, when 18 months comes around, when two years comes around, when two and a half years comes around, there's frustration, there's resentment. If you've got a spouse and you told her you're going to be rich in a year and you're not even paying the bills, like that's going to be hard, right? Um, so I, I think having realistic expectations, which means study entrepreneurship. There's great books like Lean Startup, The Art of the Start, um, other books like that, that that talk about these concepts. And so you want to, as you prepare for the business and, and not just what your idea is, you also want to start saying, what is this journey going to look like and how can I best mentally prepare for it? And, and, you know, really know if I want to commit to this. So Mark, you mentioned patience, you mentioned endurance. What other characteristics would you say are, um, traits of a successful business owner entrepreneur? Well, one of the ones that you brought up, which is a, an avid learner, like, you know, if you're going to start a business part, what goes part and parcel with that is, is really this need to wear multiple hats, right? Like you have to um, learn, uh, you have to be able to build out the products and services you're offering. You have to learn how to sell those products and services. And then you'll have to learn how to support any clients that you're able to sell on them. And each of those major business functions have a huge amount of learning. Like selling is just as iterative and uh, progressive a process as product development is. And a lot of people don't understand that they sort of fall under this naive notion of if I build it, they will come. And that works in, in movies like Field of Dreams and stuff like that and rare exception. But normally, if you build it and sell and market the crap out of it, you might maybe get a few clients, right? I mean, so you got to be an avid, avid learner would be the first thing. Um, the second thing that I think is just critical is persistence, right? Um, I, I think... Um, a lot of my success, honestly, has just been total dogged persistence. Like, I, if I am a believer in a business opportunity, I just, I don't let go of it until I've seen it all the way through. And, and I got to say that kind of with a little bit of caution, because there, there has been times where ultimately I concluded that I failed and I, I shut some stuff down. But um, that's premised on the idea that you've done your homework early before the startup phase in what I call the R&D phase of business. And you've tried to eliminate a lot of the assumptions and a lot of the risk that could exist in that business. But if you've done that part and there's good business fundamentals, you've, you've done the lean startup stuff and, and there's demand for your product and you think you've got a good solution and you've got a good marketing channel to bring it to market, then it's all about persistence. It's about every time 
uh, an obstacle comes up, just relentlessly finding ways to break through, go around, get over that wall. So Mark, so, uh, thank you for those. Learning comments. and persistence. <laughs> persistence, okay. So can you tell me about how, how important is networking uh, when it comes to, to starting a business and running a business and how do you go about networking? Well, <laughs> that's funny that you're asking me that because I actually view networking as something that's been more of a weakness for me. Um, and so, uh, in fact, um, yeah, I mean, I think early in my career, I, yeah, let me think about that. There was, there was some things I did really good. One of the things, for example, that I have done, I think better than most is I have one of the most detailed personal Rolodexes that, um, I've seen. And, um, Meaning every time I meet somebody, if I meet someone of, of interest or value in my life, if you pull them up in my address book on my phone, you'll see their name, their phone number, and then under notes, the date that I met them and everything I can remember about them. That's the best thing I've done. But that's kind of the worst thing is, is I haven't, um, especially early in my career, I didn't put myself in environments where I could really network. And me dropping out of BYU actually probably further limited some of my networking abilities. So I had networked initially with my business partners, obviously had enough of a network that opened me up to that. And then I've done it a lot professionally, but even now I actually look at it and I go, I need to do better. You know, you mentioned I have a nonprofit United Angels Foundation and um, they do great work. And one of the things I know I need to do a better job at is network because um, part of what I um, have to do with United Angels is be able to rally more influential people, especially in our local community, to that cause. And so if I'm being critical of myself, I would say what I need to do for networking is I need to schedule time for it. I need to be intentional about it. And I need to spick, uh, or pick out some specific events and opportunities and um, set some goals around it and, um, and then have someone hold me accountable. <laughs> Accountability is is very important. So, Mark, uh, we've we both know individuals that have either either started companies or started an occupation that requires a a lot of work, and sometimes they run too fast and they flame out. Yeah. So, what advice can you give uh, young adults for? being successful in business, but, but making sure that you live a balanced life? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And again, something I'm not sure I've always um, done well at, um, you know, I think actually in preparation for talking to the lecture series, I asked my wife um, if she had any feedback that I should share with the entrepreneurs. And she said, yeah, I would tell them that you're going to have no hours that are off limits. You're going to work way harder than you think. Um, a lot of people won't see sort of the work that you're doing. You'll never be able to turn it off. She, and the more she said it, I was like, well, man, I thought I was doing a better job at balancing than that. Um, and Jeff Bezos, who, you know, incredible entrepreneur, one of the things I liked actually that resonated with me that he said is he talked, he said, I think work-life balance kind of creates this false idea of equality. And he says, to me, what you need to find is work-life harmony. You need to find a way where your work and your personal life come in harmony. So that, that was one concept I would share. And then the second one actually is something that, Scott, you've been a mentor to me in my life. And something that I've seen you do well is I think you know your limits and you also know the things that you need to do to um, keep, keep your edges sharp, right? And so I've seen you be very disciplined about um, exercise or even about taking time for yourself to pursue some of your hobbies and things like that. And I think that that's an important thing, but um, I, I also think I'd be lying if I said, look, in a, at a lot of early stages, there's this part where you gotta be ready to grind, you gotta be able to work. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
and you want to find business partners that are going to be right there with you in the trenches, grinding and working as hard as you can. So thank you. So Mark, obviously you have God given talents and you've, you've used those talents to not only uh, sell your products and services, but also bless the lives of others and uh, to, to employ a lot of people, to give them a, to give them an income and to feed their families and to have purpose in life. So what advice would you give a young person that's exploring different uh, career paths, but wants to make sure that it's meaningful, that it's a, that it's a productive career? What would, what would you tell them? Yeah. Um, look, I think, I think having purpose and meaning in what you do is such an essential part of life and personal happiness. And on the one hand, I think most humans um, are actually meaning creators. We can build meaning if we can find it, but sometimes it takes creativity of thought. It's like my nonprofit, United Angels, their purpose is to support parents and families of children with special needs. That's a very meaningful and purposeful job. Um, and, and so for the, the staff that we've got that works there and the volunteers, I think it creates a lot of that meaning. Sometimes in, in other parts of the job that you, you do, it looks less meaningful, especially if you stack it against United Angels or saving the whales or doing something for the environment, right? But you got to find the meaning, right? So like with Red X, our purpose is to help real estate professionals uh, experience greater success in their job by helping them with customer acquisition. And one of the most meaningful things, like I could either choose to look at that company as I, I sell sales leads to real estate agents. Like that seems somewhat meaningless to me. It doesn't seem like very deep and meaningful work. And yet one of the most meaningful experiences um, we ever had was we invited a panel of some of our top clients to come over to our office. We flew them in and they shared how our products actually changed their life by helping them hit their financial goals. And we had a, a divorced single mother who talked about the impact it had on hers. And we had a, a father who had gone through a divorce and had custody of his kids and needed to provide a living for him. And so as we watched them talk about this, it created a discussion where we're like, this is why we do this. We're, we're doing this for our clients, right? And look at the impact we're having. And so what I would say is, is everybody, that's a great challenge. And, and I think that you got to look for the difference you can make and find a good way to articulate that. And that may go through a lot of iterations through your business, but it's an important thing for your own personal happiness to feel like you're making a difference. And if it's not just with the clients, then be sure, have an amazing culture and make a difference in the lives of the people you work with and who work for you. I think that's another key thing. Well, I know that uh, through this interview today, you're making a difference in the lives of young adults all over the world. So that's exciting. So Mark, in closing, is there any additional advice that you would give to young adults concerning their career or just life advice that you would give to them to to lead a meaningful, productive, and a, and a vibrant life and, and career? Yeah, I, I actually have two thoughts. Um, so the, the first thought I, I actually was thinking about earlier in the interview, which is th there, there's one mindset, especially within the, in the church that I, I, I try to fight a little bit, which um, one of my friends who's a professor at BYU, he calls it the prosperity gospel. And it's the idea that, you know, a lot of times we, we see successful business owners and other people come in and they talk about this. And there's uh, there could be this thought that if I'm uh, a righteous member of the church, if I follow the prophet, if I do this, then that means I will be successful in, in business and in life. And and the reality is, though, is that. Our Heavenly Father, I don't think is co as concerned with making us independently wealthy as we might be and as the world teaches us to be. 
Um, I think that if you read the scriptures and you listen to what we've been taught, I think for the most part, Heavenly Father wants to make sure that we have sufficient for our needs. And so, you know, with the BYU students, the entrepreneur students, I said to them, you know, if, if there was a, a choice between you being wealthy and you having integrity, which one do you think God wants for you? He probably wants you to have integrity. And if he wants uh, you to be wealthy or he wants you to be humble, which one do you think he might want more of, right? Humble, right? And sometimes we don't really want to talk about that. But the idea is, is that there are some of the best, most amazing, faithful members of the church I've seen who have tried and for whatever reason been unsuccessful in starting their business. And that does not mean that they weren't supposed to start it. I mean, if Heavenly Father wants to teach you a principle or guidance, there might be a very meaningful reason he wants you to start that business and go down that path. But it might not be the reason you think. It might not be to just give you wealth. It might be to have you do something good for someone else. I'll even, if it's okay, I, I have an amazing story that happened to one of my buddies just recently, but he had built a company and struggled kind of for, for years with this company. It got moderately successful. He got out of the startup phase. He was struggling in the growth phase. It just kind of tapered. They were paying their bills. They weren't losing money, but they weren't, they weren't getting wealthy. That's for sure. And an opportunity came to sell the business. And he felt a very distinct spiritual impression that he was to sell the business. And um, anyways, he, he sells the business, feels great about it. And, and actually, the, the person who buys it within a couple months, sells more in a two-month period through his business than he had done in the prior year. Mm -hmm. and, and through a lot of weird external circumstances, it wasn't even their own ingenuity. It was, it was kind of factors that he would have benefited from if he had kept the business. And so there was this moment where he was like, man, Heavenly Father, why, why did I sell this? Like, I, I, I worked for years. I prayed about it. I sweated over this. and the other member of the church who had bought the business from him came to him a few months later and said, the business we had, our business that acquired yours was going to go out of business. We were going to lose everything and lay everybody off. And because we bought your business and things worked out the way that they worked out, we didn't have to lay anybody off. And the business survived. And to me, I look at that and I go, wow, like that to me is such a heavenly father thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like we sometimes just want to look at it and be like, oh, but I could have made more money. And, it, and my friend was not at all negatively impacted by that business being sold. He just wasn't positively impacted mm -hmm. as much, right? But Heavenly Father, I think, is going to grab them on the other side and say, look at all these people. And maybe they would have lost their jobs and maybe they would have lost their faith and maybe they would have fell out of the church or something. And like, I just think Heavenly Father sometimes has purposes that go beyond what we understand. And so my final piece of advice is just this philosophy I have in life, which is life is like a river. It's got a current and it's, <clears throat> it's taking you somewhere. And part of life is the thrill of discovering where it leads you. And there's going to be times where the water is smooth. And there's going to be times where the waters of life are rough, right? And part of, part of the journey in life is that you've got to hopefully learn how to find joy in that journey, whether the water's smooth or rough. And don't get obsessed about what other people are doing on their journey because that means you're not present in what you're doing on your own. Heavenly Father, I think he's got these bounds. He lets us navigate those waters, choose our path. We can, we can make our path through that river worse than it needs to be or better than it, than it could be, you know? But I think a huge part of life is being present and, and asking Heavenly Father as our guide to make sure that we're on the right path. And so my advice to anybody seeking out their career is just be prayerful and um, be open to the spirit and 
be open to the idea that life's going to take you places that you probably aren't going to anticipate, you know, and that's part of the fun. That's part of why we're here. Well, Mark, I want to, I want to thank you for your time today and the, uh, the expert advice that you've given to, to young adults and, and uh, those that are interested in becoming a, a business owner, entrepreneur, or going in a different direction. So to, to wrap up this video, I'd like to remind our viewers that uh, they can conduct informational interviews on their own to learn about, uh, learn from seasoned professionals like Mark, uh, either if they're interested in exploring different careers or jumpstarting a career. Uh, they can ask somebody that they know that may have a contact with, with a professional, or they can just reach out and call them and say, I'd, I'd really like to learn about what's helped you to become so successful. So please go to, on our website, we have videos, how to conduct an informational interview. And, and that'll, that'll truly, truly help you. So Mark, again, thank you for your time today. And this has been awesome. And I know you're, you're going to impact many lives. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks for the opportunity, Scott.